уважаеми колеги, смятам, че представенето, което направихме в този час и половина преди обяд, беше ориентировачна добра база. Нали така? Тоест, вие добихте представа за какво ще говориме по време на майсторския клас. Аз ви споменах, че базата, върху която се изграждат теориите на gamification, crowdsourcing и така нататък, или необходимостта от тях, проистича от науката за управление на знанието. За това аз сега ще предоставя думата на професор доктор Ели Мирон, за да направи своето представене, именно свързано с управление на знанието. Някои неизъснени моменти, ако има след това, ще задавате въпроси. Аз ви казах, че на български ще отговаряме. Няма сега да го предпъсваме по време на неговото изложение, след това ще направим това обощение. Today we are going to give three lectures. The first one will be on the basics of knowledge management. The second will be on gamification. The third will be on personal knowledge management. All in the end, you will see what Professor Bakardiava said. We have connections to everything. So we start with introduction to knowledge management. And we'll start from the real, real basics. What is knowledge? What are the economic drives to manage the knowledge? What are knowledge assets? What is intellectual property? Then we'll see what are the properties that the principles of knowledge management, especially in organizations. And we'll speak a little bit on knowledge workers, which is what all of you are going to be after you, after you graduate. So this is the famous tree of knowledge. Well, is this knowledge? Is this knowledge? Or maybe this is knowledge? There are some options. So we'll try and explain what is knowledge and especially the difference between data, information, and knowledge. Data is just facts, numbers. Information becomes, when you take all the data and, and, and combine them into something that has some meaning. After you do this, you can understand what the information is about. And then, when you gain knowledge, Knowledge is something that you will use in the future. What you know now, what you learn in the university, is the basis for your future actions. So let's give a very, very short example. So you see here 9-2, you see here a red circle. It has, they have no meaning. Well, this is data. Here we have at 92 kilometers per hour, and you you see that the red circle is a red signal light. So this is information. And when you drive and you see it, the knowledge is that you have to break, otherwise something may happen. So the characteristic of knowledge is at first that knowledge is connected to people. Most of the knowledge is here. The second is that when you know something, it's the result of some thinking, of something that you have done, something in the, in the head. The third, you gain knowledge all the time. You are now listening to a lecture, you gain knowledge all the time. And as I said before, after this, it is the basis of action. Now I'll show you a, a very short video clip. It's a little difficult to understand, but I, I, I will help you. There are reports that there is no evidence of a direct link between Baghdad and some of these terrorist organizations. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown 
unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. But, <laughs> excuse me, but is this an unknown unknown? Uh, I'm not several unknowns, and I'm, I'm just wondering I'm not if this going, is an unknown. I'm not going to say which it is. But, but okay. Mr. Secretary, you know, I'm right here. Believe, I'm right here. I apologize. The sound quality here maybe is not appropriate for this clip. Anyway, this is the Secretary of Defense of the United States who spoke about Iraq involvement. And he said that uh, things that you know, you know, and things that uh, you know that you don't know. And in the end, the things that you don't know that you don't know. And this is called the Rumsfeld Matrix, which is also relevant for organizations. And you see, we, we know that we do not know. We know that we know. We do not know that we do not know. And we do not know that we know. And this is something that was a very uh, known citation by um, the manager of Hewlett Packard who said, if Hewlett Packard knew what Hewlett Packard already knows, which means what Hewlett Packard had inside the company, it would be three times more profitable. And if one translated to this matrix, the problems are the following. Why HP doesn't know what HP knows? Because A, we know that we know, but we cannot find it. Or we know, but we do not know that we know. And this is something that happens occasionally in organizations. So now we try to divide the, the knowledge into types of knowledge. And there are basically two types of knowledge. One is called explicit, which is in folders, in the computers, and the second, tacit knowledge. Tacit is what is between our ears, inside our heads. And as you see, as the example of the icebreak, most of the, very little of the knowledge is above sea level. That's explicit knowledge. Documents, videos, audios, most of the knowledge is tacit. It's an experience. It's know how what to do. Know how, how to face future needs. Now, knowledge is not invented out of the blue. It has to rely on something. And are you using Google Scholar? Anybody here uses Google Scholar? Nobody? Google Scholar is a search engine, especially for academic publications. And here, on the bottom, there is a proverb that says, to stand on the shoulders of giants. Now, it's, it sounds very, very un un understandable, but this is a citation from Newton. And Newton said, if I have seen further, it's by standing on the shoulder of giants. And this comes from a letter that Newton wrote to his friend, colleague, Robert Hooke. And what he meant to say is that all scientific developments rely on previous developments. When you start to do a work, you make a research of previous work. So you cannot do something new unless you rely on something that is already known. So, now that we know a little bit what is knowledge, we know the types, basic types of knowledge, we can look at the knowledge as a business asset. How we can use, how we can relate, how we can think on, on knowledge inside a business. There are a few ways to think about it or look about it. First of all, knowledge is something that accumulates. You have already more and more and more. The more knowledge you have, the more value it is. Of course, this is not applicable everywhere. For example, if you are a company that manufactures uh, computer parts, knowledge that relevant to things that you developed 10 years ago, you can use it now. But in, in principle, you gain more and more knowledge, the more valuable it becomes. Now, if we look on knowledge as a resource, you can't 
it's inexhaustible. If you have resources, let's say like fuel, you burn it, it doesn't exist anymore. But if you use the knowledge, it still stays. You can use it as much as you want. You can use it many times as you want. You can use it by, by any number of people in the, in, in the company. So that's why knowledge is a resource which is not exhaustible. Now, there's a very nice example by uh, George Bernard Shaw. And George, he said, if I have an apple, and my colleague have an apple, and we want to change, I want to give my colleague my apple, and my colleague wants to give me his or her apple, what will end? We will have each one one apple. The one that I gave her or him will be him. The one that I received will be mine. In the end, each of one will have an apple. But we cannot move knowledge. We cannot transfer knowledge. So if I have an idea and my colleague has an idea and we give each other our ideas, what do we have? I have two ideas, my colleague has two ideas. That's how knowledge sharing is important. So, as I said here, sharing knowledge is a positive sum game. It has few things that which are important. First of all, it increases the number of people who know the specific knowledge. Therefore, it becomes more usable. Second, I can add this knowledge, which I didn't know before, to what I knew before, and combine them and get new things that I understand. So that's how sharing knowledge increases its value. The third is that knowledge is something that's very difficult to control. Uh, in fact, I should have written here tacit knowledge, because documents is relatively easy. Still, we, we may have problems, but Tacit knowledge is really, really difficult, difficult to handle because it's in our hands. I, in order to handle the knowledge, you have to have complete control of the people, but you cannot have control, full control of the people. That's why it's difficult to control the knowledge of the company. And there's always leaks. Knowledge always, always, always leaks from the country, from the company, even in ways that we do it and we know that, that we are doing it. It's not that something is stealing from us. How, how can this happen? When we sell products, the products include in, in, in them the knowledge. You all have already heard about reverse engineering. When we submit manuals, we write how, uh, I don't think that they, they, they need to copy, we will give you links to all our lectures. So you will have everything here. You don't, you don't need to, to make uh, photographs. So now, if I go again to the example of the iceberg, the organizational aspects of knowledge are the following. The explicit is easy to replicate. It's documents. It's relatively easy to share. There is enough information about Chinese, that, for example, that stole all, all the, the designs for, for the stealth aircraft of the of United States. So you can steal files, but tacit knowledge is difficult to share and it's harder to steal. In order to steal tacit knowledge, you have to steal the person. And therefore, this, is, this provides a competitive advantage. 
Now, there are some things that you know which you have to keep which you have to keep a secret. For example, the formula of Coca-Cola. There's no patent of Coca-Cola formula. Patent uh, Coca-Cola workers keep the secret, keep the, the formula as a secret, and that's fine. They don't, they don't need a patent. They don't have to keep it. Only they, they have to do some trademarks that, that will not be copied. So, Let's move now to economic drives of knowledge management. What we are living now is named knowledge-based economy. Why knowledge-based economy? Because knowledge is a driver. If you look a little back, we had the agricultural era of agricultural aid or agricultural revolution. What was important in the agricultural age? The most important thing was land, because you use it to grow. And what was important about the land? There were two things. How large it is and where it is. If you have a very large area in the desert, maybe you won't be able to do anything with it. The second is the industrial age, where machines were more important. And all the, all the plants were measured by financial measures. So accounting was extremely important. And another thing that was important was a measure called Tobin's Q, which I'm sure you don't know what it is, but it's something very easy. It is a ratio between the market value of, say, say some machine and how much it will cost you to bring or build or purchase a new one. So that's something that's called Tobin's Q. You can see it in the Wikipedia. It was a very important measure. Now, we are in the knowledge age. And what's important in the knowledge age? Intangible assets. Intangible means something that you cannot have, hold in your hand, something that you cannot see. That's intangible. I'll give you more examples about Peter Drucker is regarded as one that started the new philosophy of management. And he says, next society will be a knowledge society, and knowledge will be its key resource. Now, you are close, so I'll, I'll show you a, a small clip from the OECD, what, how OECD looks at it. Innovation, building on human knowledge, is changing the way business invests and grows. Just as coal drove the last industrial revolution, software, databases, research and development, new business models, and the skills people bring to an organization are driving revolutionary changes today. Take Apple's iPhone. In the US, when you buy a $600 iPhone, you're paying $270 for the design, marketing, and distribution. $80 to the Korean company that makes the components, but only $6.50 to the Chinese firm that assembles it. Some developed economies now invest more in ideas and skills and other non-physical things, which together we can call knowledge-based capital, than in physical capital, like machines and equipment. For more than 20 years, the United States has been investing a larger portion of its GDP on knowledge capital than on physical capital. 
The value of many of the world's leading firms is now in their knowledge capital. For example, around only 5% of Google's value is in its physical assets. The rest is in knowledge assets, like their algorithms, their people, and their patents. Even traditionally blue-collar industries like the automotive sector are becoming more knowledge intensive. General Motors' electric hybrid car, the Chevrolet Volt, contains 10 million lines of software code. And companies are generating and collecting ever more data. In 2010, worldwide data storage capacity exceeded 1,000 billion gigabytes. Nearly 200 CD-ROMs for every person on the planet. And that's forecast to double every year. More information and more data means more opportunity to diagnose diseases or better meet the needs of customers or manage traffic flows in environmentally friendly ways. Managed properly, the knowledge revolution can benefit everyone. Many governments are rightly focusing on education, giving citizens the skills that businesses need. To promote long-term growth and the jobs of tomorrow, Governments must ensure that policies facilitate business investment in knowledge-based capital. They can target tax support in efficient ways. They can help create value from data. They can help companies experiment and invest in new ideas. And they can also better protect intellectual property rights. most important companies and you see that the intangible assets are 80% of the market value. So the next question is who in the organization is responsible for 80% of the value of the organization? Who takes care of it? And remember these are intangible assets. It's knowledge. Basically, tacit knowledge. One of the very first companies that started knowledge management in the world is a company called Bachmann Laboratories that produces chemicals. And this is a part of the original presentation by Robert Bachmann. And he says, This is my business model, which was once product driven, then market driven, and now. It's knowledge -driven. And what would make the, ex the ex uh, uh, organization knowledge driven? First of all, they have to go and use the knowledge to create new knowledge. That means the creative use of knowledge. Then we have to eliminate the barriers of communication. There are very often problems of communicating the knowledge from one part of the company to another one, from one person to another person. So we have to eliminate all the problems. We have to make the communication inside the company extremely easy. And we have to create a culture of knowledge sharing. A culture of knowledge sharing, we will speak about the culture a little later. What does the World Bank say? The bank says that the Economy and knowledge economy is based on four things. We call it four pillars. The first is the economic incentive, which is understandable. Now, what if we look more inside, what does it mean? It means that we have to get education to more people and, and better education. We have to work on innovation, on new things, not on old things. And we have to be, to be based on, on communications and all the technology, computer technology. And they have indicators. KI is a score for all four pillars, and KI is every score for the three inside, internal. So these are, this is taken from the indexes for uh, 2012, I know that you cannot read it, don't worry. You see that the first one is Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Netherlands, and Bulgaria is in place 45. 
below United Arab Emirates, below Bahrain. Oh, there are places there are enough to improve. And OECD has a lot of work on innovation. Of course, innovation is the key to future success. And this is taken from a report written in May 2010. The need for innovation in a status that we have many or much problems, global problem, problems around the world, both economic and social. The only way that populations can improve the status is by not by invest, investing in physical, but investing in, in making innovations. Therefore, future growth is dependent on innovation productivity. And they list the priorities. First of all, empowering people to innovate. The second is to help firms, help companies to innovate. And the third, creating and applying knowledge. So this is the three priorities listed by the OECD. And what do the OECD mean by creating and applying knowledge? First of all, ensure that we have a modern and reliable knowledge infrastructure for education. And the second is to facilitate knowledge flow. And in fact, knowledge management is almost all how to manage the knowledge flow, not the knowledge itself. You cannot manage knowledge. Now, let's see how the corporate market value is fixed. Now, we have three things. One is the tangible cap capital, the things that we can see in our thing or touch. The second is the intellectual capital, which is intangible. And the third is financial, what we have in the bank. I'll speak only about this, and we can divide it into three parts. The first, human capital, structural capital, and relational capital. I'll explain each one. So the human capital is experts and the expert of the skills, uh, the skills of the expert, which is, as I said before, this is tacit knowledge. Now what structural? Structural is the processes that deal with knowledge. Is the intellectual property of the company. For example, patents. Patents are intellectual property. So all this is explicit knowledge. And we have also relational capital. Relational means what are we learning from our customers. What do we know about the customers? When we know about the customers, we know about the market. And, of course, we have reputation. Reputation is a line which, which is in the financial report of a company. It is, says how, money, how much money the reputation works, well, is worth. There are nice books about intellectual capital. Thomas Stuart wrote a few of the most uh, known ones. And he said that intellectual capital is becoming corporate's most valuable asset. The challenge is to find what you have and to use it. This is one of the things that knowledge management deal with. The principles from Thomas Stuart books are the following. First of all, companies do not own relational capital, which is called customer capital, and human capital. So we have to understand that we have to share this knowledge and get the people who work for us to use it. The second is 
that the company needs to foster teamwork. And why is that? Because we are, we, are, we are becoming more and more and more specialized. When you go, once you went to a dentist, there was only, only one person who deal, dealt with your teeth. Now you have one that takes teeth out, one that makes transplants, one that makes root canal. So there's, with so much more information and so much more knowledge, you have to arrange for teamwork, otherwise you won't succeed. Another thing is you have to understand that tacit knowledge is most important. I try to rephrase it in a different way. You cannot look at people as cost. How much they cost you? You have to look at people as an asset, asset, not a cost. This is very important because if a company has problems, the first thing to do is reorganization. What does reorganization mean? <coughs> you throw some people out, and then maybe you throw the, the knowledge within. Like you say, you throw the baby with the, with the water. Information knowledge can and should substitute physical asset because it's more important. Knowledge is custom, which means knowledge is not something that's standard that you can copy it from every place. You have to adapt things to, to, uh, to what you need. And this last is what I said before. Knowledge management focuses on the flow of knowledge. And we have to focus on the flow of knowledge and not of materials. I don't know if you know this person, it's a very famous journalist called Thomas Friedman, and he wrote a book which says the world is flat. Galileo was wrong. The world is flat. What does it mean the world is flat? Everything is connected. There's something in the picture here that it's very difficult to see. So I'll mark it. He wears a watch. What does it mean, the world is flat? Let's see. The first of all is globalization. Everything is connected. The whole world is connected. That's globalization. There's internet. The clients know in real time what you are selling, what their competitors are selling. That's why the competition becomes stronger. Now, the rate of change of technology is very, very fast. How long ago you, you didn't have a smartphone? Now almost everybody has. When do you think that we will be able to fax objects? Very soon, with 3D printers. When? Very soon, with 3D printers. With, very soon, OK. I think that you are very close. You can buy now a 3D printer that you can fax objects. Now, we took it from the internet. It's not in the future, it's happening today. It will change everything. And of course, it's knowledge driven. And Charles Darwin said, it's not the strongest that survived, but the one that knows how to adapt himself to the changing environment. You have to see what's happening and you have to change what you are doing in order to survive. If you will not do it, Kodak didn't do it, they continued with films and there's no Kodak. So you have to do it. One more thing that I want to tell you is Blue Ocean Strategy, which is a nice book. And what is Blue Ocean Strategy? We start with Red Ocean Strategy, which means marketing. We have to compete in existing market. That's Red Ocean Strategy. How do you compete in existing market? Promotions, price cut, and big discounts. That's a way to, to, to compete. But we want Blue Ocean. What does Blue Ocean mean? Blue Ocean is an ocean without competition. 
And how do you get to all them without competition? Only by being innovative. That's the key to success. So, knowledge management. Knowledge management can be looked as an oxymoron. Oxymoron is, a, is something that composed of two words which opposite meanings. For example, hell angels. For example, a decent criminal. So, can you manage knowledge? I will give you two uh, definitions from the American uh, Productivity and Quality Center, APQC. One is a systematic effort to enable information and knowledge to grow and create value. That's one, one thing. The second thing, I think the professor, professor Bakardieva mentioned it in a way, is something that managing the processes of the flow of knowledge to get the right knowledge to the right people at the right time and the right place. The second definition, you can find 100 more good definitions, just as an example. Knowledge management is regarded to, to be sitting on, 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 on four pillars. Content. You need to have content. Knowledge is content, not just something. You have to know. The second is the processes that produce knowledge, the processes of work, which include knowledge. The third is technology. Now, well, with the computer, with everything, with so much knowledge, we have to have good technology that will help us handle the knowledge. Without it, we cannot do it. However, there are many places that fail in knowledge management because they put systems, they put, let's say, something they call content management or document management application. They say, okay, wait, we have knowledge management. No, technology by itself cannot be used not to, to manage knowledge. And the fourth is what we call culture of people. We need to have the proper culture, the proper education, the proper uh, behavior toward knowledge. Otherwise, we will not be able to handle knowledge. In fact, a successful implementation of any knowledge process or solution or application requires that all four applications will be present. And I will also tell you that the most difficult one is the knowledge management culture. This is to, to, to get people out of things that they were doing, out of thinking, it, it's very difficult. The most important problem is knowledge culture. Now I brought you some transparency, some, uh, transparencies from, uh, from slides from Boeing, original Boeing slides. So you see, not from what a university professor says, but what actual company says. So this is Boeing, and it says, knowledge management matters to Boeing for many reasons. Why? To retain the expertise of employees that leave the company, to share what we know. If I know something and other employees know something, I want to tell him so he will be also use the new knowledge. And avoid reinvention. Many times, many, many things happen that you didn't know that something exists and you reinvent it once again. There's some more slides by Boy. The first of all, look at what they says. Approximately 10% of the corporation reside in repository. If I go back to the beginning of the talk, 10% is explicit knowledge in documents. And 90% is in the gray matter, in the heads, tacit knowledge. 90% of Boeing knowledge is tacit. So how is critical knowledge lost? There uh, are many things. First of all, the experts have too much work to do. And in this case, they cannot help others use their expertise. The second is, 
culture. I, I, I mentioned culture a few times today. If you don't have knowledge sharing culture, will not, you will not share knowledge. The third is a culture of blame. What does a culture of blame mean? It means that if you make a mistake, you will not say, I made a mistake. And if you will not say, I made a mistake, it cannot be fixed. But you have to fix it for the future. But if you are afraid to say, to admit, I made a mistake, nothing will happen. The force is knowledge is available by it lies dormant. Dormant means somewhere where you, can, where you cannot find it. Like, like the example of Hewlett Packard. You have the documents, but you cannot find them. The second, another is a problem which is called NIH or not invented here. People are happy to, to, to invent new things. And in order to be practical, you have to reuse current knowledge, not to invent new things. I'll skip this one. And the other one is one of the most important problems. People are leaving the company and the knowledge lives with them. There's no effort done to, I don't want to say the word transfer, but to get this knowledge to be known by other people in the company. So this is the service problem. There are also some international regulations that requires you to manage knowledge. I'll, I'll go through them very briefly. <coughs> SOX is Sarban Oxley Act, which is usually required by companies that are working in the United States or with the United States. And it has uh, some requirements for document management. Records here means a document which has some formal parts in it. It's not a line in the, in the database. Here, record is a special type of formal legal document. The implications of SOX are personal. I mean, if you will become a manager and you don't act according to SOX, you are personally, personally, personally responsible. Now, another thing is the problem of finding the documents which inside. And this, although it's old, but it still shows the direction, 28% of the organizations take them more than one month to accumulate all the documents they need in case that they have some legal problems. They have to take them to the court to fight some patent. So it's a, it's a, it's a very big problem. So you have to be litigation ready. Litigation readiness means that you have to to use all the processes in order that the documents that are required or will be required in the future for any legal act will be ready. There are also sometimes some ISO requirements, but I, I, I won't be able to listen to, uh, to all. Now, I, I wanted to give you a, an example of a, a consulting company called Deloitte. Deloitte has 182 consultants all around the world. And it happens quite a lot that one consultant gains some experience, but it is not shared with consultants from another country. So the need for information sharing and knowledge sharing in such a company is very important. How did they solve it, by the way? Anybody has an idea? How did they solve this problem? Nobody gets us here. Gamification. They solved it by using gamification techniques. Another example for knowledge loss. This is, was published in 2009. How the U.S. forgot to make Trident missiles. Trident missiles are nuclear missiles which 
United States manufacturing sales to Britain. And what happened? When they wanted to re-manufacture a set of missiles, they found out that they didn't know how to manufacture one of the key items, called, what's called fallback. What happened? Six hundred million more expenditure in more than one year. Why? Because they didn't know how to retain the, the important knowledge. So what happened? Of course, they didn't have enough records, and almost all people with the know-how how to do it disappeared. So I'll, I'll, I'll go over this very briefly. Knowledge management starts from the problem of information age, the knowledge age, and we have the need to use proper, uh, intellectual property and knowledge assets. We have also the problem of information overflow. We have too much knowledge. We have to learn all the time in the organization. We have to get a proper knowledge culture, otherwise we will not be able to use it. We will speak today about personal knowledge management, content, we have to use applications that handles the content, the documents, the audio, the video. We are now using social knowledge management. It means using all the social applications that we have outside, we use it inside the organization. I'll speak today a, a little bit about knowledge management in the cloud. And knowledge continuity means that you have to keep the knowledge all the time. It, or in other words, knowledge continuity means that you have to put measures to prevent the loss of knowledge. That the knowledge will continue all the way. Now, uh, uh, I'll collect everything a little to you and speak about worker types. Now, in the agricultural age, you had manual, manual workers that practically did everything the same. In the industrial age, you still had manual workers that practically everyone did the same. But now, no. Now we have knowledge workers, which are a different kind. You can't treat knowledge workers as a manual worker. And if we go again to our old friend Peter Drucker, he said, knowledge management, productivity, knowledge worker productivity is the thing that the company should take care of mostly. Knowledge workers has a duality, you know, like light has a duality. It's also a particle, a photon, it's also a wave. Knowledge worker also has some dual personality. It's a knowledge user and knowledge creator. It's a, it's a person that learns all the time, but also teaches all the time. So we have to pay attention on knowledge duality. Now, this is something that will be connected later in the gamification. What type of incentive is appropriate to what type of people? Look. If you have people that do mechanical tasks, simple tasks, like in the industrial age, if you give them enough money, they will do better. However, something very strange happens when you do it with knowledge workers, which means they do mental work. If you give them monetary Money, more money as a price, the performance goes down. Gamification, motivation will, will put, it's very important here, and the factors that, that enhance knowledge market productivity will hear it in the gamification. The gamification is 
geared toward gaining the following. A knowledge worker wants to be good, as good as possible in what he or her is doing. They want autonomy. They don't want that everyone will tell them what to do in every little thing. They, will, they need to get a job and do it as they know. And the last thing is relatedness or purpose. You want to do it in a way that you feel that, that you do something good. A knowledge sharing culture is required in addition to all those things. One of the things that you hear very often, that knowledge is power. The knowledge is power, of course, is anti-knowledge sharing. When it is true that knowledge is power in organizations, when this knowledge is required to make a specific decision, or when it's held by a single person, so I'm very important. I will not tell anybody my knowledge. I'm, <laughs> I'm no replacement. I'm power. And we want to promote knowledge sharing. How do we want it happen? We want to promote knowledge sharing culture. And the last thing, which is also product of gamification is to have the person say, I want to. I want to do it. Not I need to do it, but I want to do it. This is what IBM says about knowledge and power. First of all, knowledge is power, yes, but the power that drives the economy. Second, for us, IBM, knowledge is the power to deliver worse to the clients. The second, the third is that knowledge helps our professionals, our experts, to produce new things. And when knowledge shared, its power grows exponentially. I don't know about the exponentially, but I definitely know about the growing. Now we have, a, 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 I know that uh, people in marketing, so I'll say about how knowledge management is connected to marketing. Just a little bit, because we can't do it too much. This is a company that produces reports. It's called McKinsey Quarterly. And we are all marketers now. What does it mean we are all marketers? It means that all the people who work in the company should be involved in marketing. And why is that? There are reasons to it. Because customers have now the power, the ability of customers to upload content to the internet gives them power which was never before. And I hope that this one will, will, will produce properly. The plane departed Halifax, connecting in Chicago's old air. While on the ground, a passenger said from the seat behind me, My God, they're throwing guitars out there. The band and I exchanged a look, best described as terror, at the action on the tarmac. Knowing whose projectiles these would be So before I left Chicago I alerted three employees Who showed complete indifference towards me United
Let's unite and pray. There's a strange problem with audio. With audio here. You, you hear good the music, but you don't hear what they speak. So uh, I try to, to explain what is in, in this video clip. This musician went on a United States, a United Airlines flight, and he had his guitar in the baggage. When he, he looked from the window, he saw that the porters are throwing the guitar. And when he took it from, from, the, uh, from the baggage plane, he found that the guitar was broken. And he complained to United Airlines, but they didn't want to do anything. So, he made this video clip. I, I'm sorry that you couldn't, couldn't hear it properly, but I do have a report on the results of this video clip. So, the United Brakes Guitar video was released and had 7 million views. I think that it's now, this number increased. The second is, what did United Airlines do in response to this video clip? At the first time, nothing. Just nothing. Finally, was after a week or two. But then, the musician David Carroll gained so much attention from this video clip that he said, I don't need it. The outcome, United Airlines stock price went down 10% and the shareholder lost, if they wanted to sell, $180 million. So, what do we learn of it? United Airlines neglected to respond quickly to a video that says, hey, you don't perform as you should. Key takeaways. Quick response is critical. When you hear something about your company, you have to deal with it as quickly as possible. It's not enough. You have to use all channels that you can in order to do it. But this is, in fact, what we, something that we have said already, so I'll, I'll skip it. But this is from the Harvard Business Review, which I'm, I'm sure you know. In a world where a angry, single angry tweet can cause a lot of damage, not, not speaking about the video clip, corporations need to unleash, to use all the employees to fight back. And this is the explanation of what I showed you at first from McKinsey, we are all marketers. It means that all the, the, the workers, all the knowledge work in the company has to be attentive, have to be used, has to be uh, helpful with dealing with the customers. So that's why everything is marketers. Okay, I think it's time. Any questions? Музиката Фактически, най-важното, което те определи, това е споделянето на знанието, споделянето на информацията и развитието в годините от, видяхте, интересните фотоси, които той представаше, довежда до економиката, базирана на знанието, в която ние се намираме и като автор, тук всички знаят, Питър Друкър, той също го цитира. Той посочи основните стълбове на економиката на знанието, а именно образованието в основата и иновациите, инновационните технологии, инновативните технологии. Той ни посочи няколко факти, 
от ОСД, Организацията за економическо сътрудничество и развитие. Видях, че България къде беше посочена там. Аз трябва да кажа, че така ви не се превежда тук на гостите. Това тая година, ако са погледни, защото беше 2012, ще сме още по-надолу сигурно от това, което е било тогава. Основните процеси, които настъпват в нашето време, процесите на глобализация, процесите на конкуренция, клиентоцентризъма, това, че всичко е насочено към клиентите, бързата промяна на технологиите и т.е. да ни посочи тази скорост фактически колеги, той ни попита за 3D факса. Аз се изненавам тук, защото моите студенти, поне които са от залата, аз им пуснах клипче за 3D принтер, смисъл показах, казах, че има 3D принтери, казах, че има 3D лазери, сканиране, т.е. трябваше да отреагирате, че това е факт, че вече го има. А тези машинки си имат и 3D факт, са видяхте го точно. Т.е. това не е нещо, което не го знаем, но не успяхме да отреагираме, както и да е. След това той разгледа две книги, които са типични, характерни за областта на маркетинга. Едната се наричаше си Blue Ocean Strategy, а другата Red Nelly. Фактически тези две книги той ни ги показва, за да открои конкретно ситуацията в момента в света в отношение на ролята на инновациите и тяхното приложение като ключ към успеха във всяка една компания. Като тук той разгледа стълбовете на това, а именно какво съдържание, какъв контент ние предлагаме на нашите потребители. И фактически тук аз еднага правя връзка с това, което също аз съм казвала на моите студенти, ролята на съдържанието, т.е. доставчиците на съдържание на контент в момента в световната економика, в световното развитие, са хореографите, които водят и ръководят фактически сцената в световен мащаб. Т.е. какво ще бъде в момента хит? Това го правят доставчиците на контент. Той тук също го спомена това нещо, заедно с другите стълбове процесите, по които се осъществява, технологиите, които се използват и най-важният стълб – човека. Човека с своята култура. Култура за управление на знание. И култура, която се създава в компанията. Посочени примера на Боинг, за практиката на Боинг за споделяне на информация, това, че не се знае какво се прави от един отдел, как се прехвърля експертизата от един отдел на друг отдел, че фактически 10% от цялата информация, която като знание се счита заложена в тази голяма компания, мощна компания, е в документи. Всичко останало, 90% е тъцитно знание, т.е. знание, което е в главите на хората. И най-големия проблем е пак споделянето на информацията. Как това знание да стане явно знание, открито да стане в явно? Той посочи също проблема с кризисната ситуация при загуба на знание. Т.е. как се изгубва знанието, какво се случва в една организация, когато се изгуби знание, а то ни трябва, даже примера беше, ако има някакви съдебни процеси, примерно, ако вървят, и как те трябва да бъдат решени въпросите по време на съда, когато ние трябва да търсиме тази информация. И примера беше, че какво беше там повече от месец, 28% се счита от всички организации, статистика изразходват повече от един месец, за да намерят необходимата информация, когато се налагат такива важни съдебни процеси. Другото, което спомена при закупата на знания, което ние също усещаме в университета като организация, ви ще споменете при вас, че когато напусне човек, евентуално човека се отива с това знание. Няма преемственост, няма надстрояване. Трудно се намират документите, с които хората са работили. И за това всичко това той прави тези, не случайно ги прави всички тези подсказки, защото след това ще се появи какво е решението. Т.е. как това се предотвратява в компаниите. С това той отжили толкова време да ни сложи тази база. Даде ни примера и с Deloitte, където също е известна фирма, особено в сферата на финансовия менеджмент, където също се оказва, че няма добро споделяне на експертиза между работещите в компанията. 
загубата на информация, показани в НАСА, колко важни фактически процеси са се случили именно поради загуба на информация. И процеса на непрекъснато с назнанието, т.е. това, което току-що споменах, за да се достигне до някакви решения, трябва да има непрекъснатост на това знание, което с годините се натрупва, а не да има такива сривове. Работещите в предишния век, т.е. хората на предишния век, хората на 20 век и хората на нашия 21 век. Каква разлика има в това, кво и какво работи като задачи, т.е. с какво се занимава, когато изпълнява своите ангажименти на своето работно място. Фактически, knowledge workers, хората на нашето време, са хората, които използват знания, той нарече двойнственост, тяхната работа е нарече именно заета от две страни заети хора, а именно с създаване и с използване на това знание. И интересна съпоставка, която той ни показва тук и я свърза с gamification, тези криви, които вървяха нагоре и надолу червена и зелена, когато фактически се използват процеси или фактически вървят процеси, които са механични. Тоест нещо правиме механично и рутинно всеки ден, но и също отиваме в 8 часа на работа, примерно, и вървиме до 5 и там удреме някакъв печат или пък правиме нещо рутинно. Тоест механично. И получаваме пари за това. Тоест това не е фактически вече задоволително за хората на нашето време. Т.е. хората не са доволни от това, което те правят. Те искат фактически да имат друго усещане. И затова другата скала беше надолу. Фактически хората на изследователския труд, на умствения труд, хората не получават много случаи, не получават пари за това, което те правят. Но те се стремят да усетят смисъла на това, което правят, като краен изходен резултат. Т.е. да има някаква целенасоченост, да има някакво усещане, че се прави нещо полезно. Т.е. да се усети това, че те осъзнават силата, тяхната чрез от знанията, което те, знанията, които те имат. И фактически, като заключение, той въобще, че трябва да промотираме споделянето на знания, трябва да могат тези знания да се надграждат, защото точно знанието е мощ. И завърши с аз искам да направя нещо. Не е най-важното, а не аз трябва да направя това. Т.е. ние трябва да осъзнаем, че ние сме свободни и след като сме свободни, ние сме работещи. Съответно, аз завършвам с това, но това беше първият слайд, с който пък аз започна. Това е случайно съвпадение. Ние не си знаем презентацията един друг. Абсолютно случайно е. Така че се счита наистина, че във времето, в което живеем, ние натрупвайки всички тези знания, ни ставаме все по-свободни. Но го усечам. Благодаря ви.